Welcome to World Archery's Coaching Summit. And today's workshop is all about push and pull, about the release, backhand, front hand, all these things are going to be discussed today. I'm Karen Bashir, but before we get cracking with this uh, topic, let's introduce our experts. Let me, let me go first. My name is Kishik Lee. I'm working for USA Archery, head coach, and also I'm serving for World Archery as a chair of the coach committee. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm next on the list. Uh, Richard Priestman, I'm the head coach for Archery GB. Hello, I'm Jacqueline Borosendal. I'm a coach of the Dutch archery team. Hello, I am Gök Tuergin. Uh, I'm a head coach and technical director of Turkish archery team. And also I'm a deputy chair of coaching committee from World Archery. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Delgado. I'm the director of the War Archery Excellence Center and director of the Foundation of War Archery. And glad to, to join you all. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time today. Uh, we've got a very interesting subject. And Juan Carlos, I'm going to ask you, uh, what on earth are we talking about when we're talking about front hand, back hand release? Should you push or should you pull? Can you just explain uh, the basis of our uh, subject of conversation today? Okay, you give me the easiest question to start with. Okay, thank you very much. I would say that uh, archery we are using both hands and uh, one has to do one thing, the other one has to do another thing and that's when the complex starts. We have to get that position. In this position we have to be aligned. We have to get our reference to make sure that when we are pushing or expanding or making the, the shot, we are directing the right direction. So the, the dilemma starts when we try to aim with the sides and we have the tendency to block it, to try to fix it. But when you fix, at the same time, you have to move to pass through the clicker. So that's the problem. When we move, we move the side as well. When we fix the side, we have the tendency to stop also the expansion. And here is where the, the different ways to do it, of pushing more, pulling more, or both sides. Some talk about pull, push. Some talk about expansion. Some go further in having a proper position, because without a proper position, you cannot start with the expansion. There are different exercises or techniques to do it, and I think that's what we are going to discuss. But I think all is about of getting to understand what is stopping us to make the shot and what facilitates to make it in the right direction. Well, thanks for that explanation. Kisik, I'm going to come to you next. Um, in the simplest terms to start with, and then I'd like you to, why is this so critical to a top archer? I think, first of all, how you expanding either left, push, or pull, this is most uh, uh, the crucial point in order to uh, hit the target more consistently. That's why this topic, we're not really talking publicly much, but I think this is a great uh, opportunity. We can share information with all coaches to the students. So consistency is what it's all about. Well, that's uh, what a lot of archery is about. Uh, Jacqueline, I'm going to come to you because uh, I want to talk. I want to talk to you about how you coach this particular act of uh, of the release uh, of the arrow. Uh, we are uh, very much practicing with a uh, uh, foremaster, and the basic of a, a, a proper release and timing is the balance. So you also need to have a very uh, steady. Uh, head when you so the uh, draw length is always the same okay got to uh, a question for you then around about the sort of general technique because uh, i think for for you experts you know exactly what you're talking about perhaps for someone who's coming into archery very early a youngster perhaps what are we actually talking about i mean literally from standing on the shooting line what 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 are what is this subject about you mean in the release? Yeah, I, what, um, and, and how we get to that point. Yeah, the, that point is most most critical part of the shooting, but uh, also most difficult part to teach. Because first we have to teach how to draw and how to make uh, uh, correct alignment. Because uh, as Juan Carlos says before, pre draw is most important point of the shooting for, for me, from my point of view. If Archer have correct shoulder alignment, if archer have correct drawing, it's easier to teach the release because release has to be uh, clear in the archer's mind first. 
archery has to understand and also uh, as like Jacqueline says draw length has to be consistent and every shot has to be we can we always try to get exactly the same but it's not possible but it should be as much as uh, same and also when you start teaching the release you have to say uh, you don't have to say it is release because uh, in the name of in the when you're talking about the word release it make it seems the archer has to be relaxed just after release but release not end of the shooting the release is just beginning of the shooting actually because after that we have to have correct follow through follow through if the archer think when he, he just or he or she just release the string the art, uh, shooting is over that will be a re really big problem it will be really uh, difficult to solve and other things what what it comes after and because of this it's really important to teach release and we have to decide which point is exactly correct to start to teach the release then in my point of view before release we have to teach proper shooting proper drawing and correct drawing alignment shoulder alignment okay interesting stuff so, uh, richard uh let's assume we've got to that point uh, that Gok talks talked about we've done the perfect draw um explain uh th what we're talking about when we talk about clicker and release how do the two uh, relate to each other um chris i just wanted to just go back a little step first really because um one thing we haven't said already is is that the fundamental part about the archer shot is movement um, without movement, we don't have a shot. Uh, we don't get through a clicker. We don't. We don't get to the any execution or follow through position. So, you know, the the movement starts at hooking, gripping, and it finishes at the end of the follow through. The clicking moment is just one instant in time in the middle of the shot process. So, ideally, we've got to full draw. We've found our alignment. Uh, our sight's somewhere near the middle. Uh, we've generated our movement from whichever side of the body or both sides that we get it from, the clicker drops whilst we're moving. Uh, there's a subconscious reaction to that. It's not conscious mind. And our fingers and, and bow arm um, complete to the end of the follow through. Okay. And so I don't, I don't see that. Uh, I don't like the word release. That just sounds like, we, as the doctor says, we, we just open the fingers. We don't press a button. We don't open. It's just uh, an automatic response to the clicker. Uh, you see top arches that the fingers still appear to be in the curled position at the end of the follow through. It's like nothing's happened to the fingers at all. So are you, uh, Richard, are you talking then about a sort of more holistic uh, approach to the, to everything from drawing to releasing rather than specifically at that one point? Is that, is that how you, how you coach it? Yeah, that's how I coach it. I, I, I don't dwell on the idea of release. I think that just um, that so many archers mess up because they don't finish the full process. And I, I try to talk about the whole thing together, like holistic, as you say. And, and when does that process start? And I suppose end. The process starts um, as soon as you make the decision to start and open the boat. And it ends with the, the very end of the follow through when the bow stopped moving. Okay. Okay. Interesting stuff. Uh, okay. Juan Carlos, yes. going back to you. Um, look, there's a heck of a load of detail in here. All of you very knowledgeable, lots of uh, uh, archery specific vernacular. One thing that I do want to just hone in on a little bit is we're, we're talking about, we have talked about push and pull. What, what does that mean? Can you, can you describe that to a, you know, a non-archer like me. I would like to go a bit further. I'd like to explain how I understand the difficulties to make it happen. So by working with the difficulties, we can try to see what we all have in common, and then there are different styles to do it. Let's first of all I clarify, for me, technique is those positions that is easy to do consistently without less effort. So for this, to reach a good position, you have to be in a proper bone alignment. So all the muscle you use to expand, you are not using them to hold the position. So for me, this is a key part. For many years, I've been having a wrong position, though my muscles are more focused in keeping the position than in fact expanding. So that was blocking me to expand. And with many arches we work, we have the challenge that they are not in the right position. They are not aligned. The shoulders are not aligned. The body is not straight. 
So whatever they put effort, as Richard say, when they want to make the movement, in fact, the system is changing constantly because they are not balanced and not stable, not in line. So for me, the expansion starts first by getting a proper position. When you're in a proper position, you don't need to make too much effort to hold the bow. And then the second key part is if the finger is not, the hook of the string is not good, it's expanding, you put tension in the system and it's moving. Or when you put tension in the system, the, the grip is sliding. This also stops us to expand. So we have to get a proper position in the hand, proper grip. So when we have a proper body position, a proper grip position, we put force in the system, in fact, the bow starts expanding. And then we can go to different techniques or styles, which is I push more, frangili, very much pushing in front. I pull more, many of the European archers, or I make an expansion with, I don't like to say 50-50 because it's very difficult to know 50-50, but at least making them both sides expanding. And then we can go to a specific style like Kisik, which is teaching the holding and the transfer and all this, which at the end always start with a proper position. So for helping archers and coaches to reach expansion before going into what is pull and what is push, I would insist very much to get in a good position, bone alignment, arm alignment, shoulder alignment, and get a good grip and a go hand position. That whatever effort you put in the system, it's used to expand the bow and not to change the position. I'm not sure if I've been clear enough. <laughs> I, I think I understand. I think all of you are the same sort of thing. You've got to get to this good position first before we even start to begin to talk about push, pull, release, uh, the clicker and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I think 80% of the problem of answers when they are not able to expand is for the previous stages. It's not for expanding itself. It's just not the proper grip or not the proper position. For the purposes of uh, this workshop, let's, let's assume that the archers we're talking about can get to that good starting position. Uh, Kisik, I'm going to come to you. And before I do, I'm, I, I'm just going to explain to the audience out there that when we, these guys are talking about push and pull, we're talking about being in that perfect position, as Juan Carlos has already said, and it's whether you push the expansion uh, with the front hand or pull with the back hand. Very, very basically. I, I know you guys are sitting there going, mm, there's a bit more to it than that, which I know, Kisik, you, you coach amongst other people, Brady, uh, Brady Ellison. Brady talks balance rather than push and pull. Uh, and I think Juan Carlos has already said you, you, you perhaps take a, a slightly unique approach. Can you explain a little bit more about that and specifically what Brady's talking about when he talks about balance? I think as, a, as an archer, when we are looking for something more steadier or like the no changing distance of the draw length, while you're expanding and make more accuracy, make more consistency, it balance has to be there. So people like what I heard a lot of things from the international archers talking about how they should. Some people say I'm pushing. Some people say I'm just pulling. However, if you do not balance while you do that, then your shot is not going to be consistent as well as you not hit the target well. So this is the reason why uh, we have to think about more scientifically how we can approach this expansion phase because expansion is the, the most uh, critical and crucial the step of the shooting. No matter how you pull back and no matter how you hold the ball and no matter how you ready mentally, but if you're not expanding properly, then everything is just the part. It's not going to work properly. So for my case, I would uh, more thinking more to push the bomb rather than pull because there are many reasons. Especially think about it, how we can make a better balance. It depends on which dominant hand is yours. So most likely people shooting more like non-dominant side with the bomb and dominant side with the pulling the string, correct? So that how we gonna balance in between this non-dominant side and first dominant side. So when we teaching these things, people may thinking about I'm pushing today and once later, now I'm pulling. You know, they, they change their feeling. But that's, we cannot just go with the, what Archer is saying. As we, as coach, we have to stick with the more reasonable uh, teaching method, which means I recommend have more, uh, using more non-dominant side first. 
That way, naturally, you can balance. Means arches can have much, much more stronger, steadier, and efficient way they can shoot. They can find out very easily. Okay, Jacqueline, do do you do you agree with that approach? Is that the same approach you take, or do you change for the for different arches? Uh, we we are uh, looking for uh, different uh, ways. Uh, also, you can only focus on one thing at a time. And when you are focusing on your chest in the middle, you can make the movement with one focus in the middle and you open your chest and then you have a 50-50. And you can also uh, look at the weather. It's now very windy here, so you need to have more uh, muscle uh, on the front. So you can aim better with your sides. So conditions, uh, conditions and, and yes. specific, specifically what you're training at the same time. Uh, Gokta, do you have any more thoughts on, on that and, and specifically that, that moment of expansion? Yeah, about the expansion, I always try to focus just one point after drawing. I always keep saying to my archers, just drop the ball and just be sure you draw 99% and there should be only 1% left and that 1% will move just with one part of your body. Then you have to understand which point is that. I always focus on the right side, actually. Uh, I don't uh, check arches dominant side or non-dominant side, but as Kisiki say, we always, uh, I always focus on the drawing side, not the pushing side, just like him. But I, I always try to teach the archer the expansion should be as like a trigger. All archer has to have some trigger point then Archer has to release when he decides, not when uh, clicker draw. When Archer decides, he has to move that part, which is, uh, which part, I don't know, every, every Archer has different point. I mean, for Yasemin, we just focus on his elbow point. He, she, when she draw the ball, he, she just focusing, just a little bit rise up her right elbow. Then it, it, it works. For Mete, it's completely different. We always focus on the transfer. When he full draw, he just try to transfer his uh, elbow. He just try to move back his elbow a little bit, not too much. That means only two millimeters. But in every archer, we have different kind of methods. But always, I always try to make it only one point. After full draw, archer has to focus on just one point to move just one millimeter. And because of this, I said before, shoulder alignment and federal position is most important and how to teach the release. Richard, um, I've got a, uh, a pro well, I think it's a simple question, but I'm sure it's got a very complicated answer. Juan Carlos mentioned that, um, that European archers tend to pull more. Uh, so everyone's talking about a balance and, and difference between athletes. Is, is it the case that you would coach to, to pull more? No, I've always been a pusher um, <laughs> right through my early shooting days, which started a long time ago. And for mo well, all of my archery career, all the coaches have said that was wrong. And yet my instincts were right. And I wish I'd had more confidence in my own thoughts you, right from the start. You were, the pushing a, visionary. Was, you were a visionary. You started first. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, the, so my, my premise really was that I mean, for the early days, I could not get through the clicker pulling because it, it made me very anxious. Uh, I could never do a good release. I uh, couldn't follow through properly. So my logic was that if I could have a fixed back sight, you know, fixed on the chin, that's so why I used to clamp everything around my neck. And, and, uh, and then my idea was a bit more like a rifle. I have a fixed back sight. And then I have this ability to extend off the front and move the sight into the middle. Um, and follow through into the middle. This gets, uh, I get a lot of questions about this in England and coaches much prefer to pull, but I just think it's fundamentally flawed because if you start pulling through the click in a linear way, you're going to move your backside, the string's going to slide on your chin, you're going to get string drag, uh, you're going to get a clutch release half the time. So it, I think it's a good way to learn, but it, I think it's fundamentally flawed when you want to get to a, a higher level. Okay, now you, you yeah. talked about a number of things there, Richard. Can I, can I just ask you to clarify one thing? You're talking about uh, your back sight moving. What, what do you mean uh, about that very specifically? Well, if you just think we have, uh, with, with a recurve bow, 
well, say the compound bow, you have a peep sight, so you have a fixed back sight. Uh, with a recurve bow, we've got this movable head, we've got the string can go anywhere on your face, against your nose. So if we're pulling through, the danger is as you're pulling through the clicker, you'll start to squash your nose, the string slides on your chin, or you pull your chin around. So wherever that head moves, you're gonna hit somewhere else on the target. So it's very hard to have consistent grouping that way. Yep. So I want to have the, the head being fixed, uh, a fixed point on the chin, uh, just a constant really. And then if we think of the, the line around your head and your neck, this is the kind of the axis of your shot and everything revolves around that. So whether you're a expand off the front or leave off the back, or we rotate our chests, we have this fixed central point. I think it's quite easy for the archers to get the heads around that to understand it. Yeah, that's, that's, sorry, go uh, on. Let me just, uh, Richard, it's perfect. Exactly what is the, the key part what I find on many archers. They're very focused in thinking that the accuracy comes from the side, but in fact, the not accuracy come by changing the, the knocking point to the eyes, this distance. And as you say, the string left and right, it was making the arrow not accurate. So as much as you start pulling back, more you can change this end of the arrow and change the angle and the direction of the arrow. So that's why I also recommend very much like Kisikli. It's more about pulling, uh, pushing, sorry, pushing, going to the target, which this you can adjust the side and keeping this part stable. You create a back tension, you create a tension in the back and you start going to the target, which I don't know about this uh, prominent arm, but I love it, uh, Kisik. It's an excellent okay. example. The well, dominant well, arm, yes, yeah. dominant yeah. arm. Yes, the dominancy, but I very much insist in the archer to make sure that this part, the distance from the knock to the eyes and the alignment is consistent. And that is easy to achieve if you are not uh, pulling, but you are pushing. Okay, so uh, look, for, for novices like me, uh, how, do, how do we spot that? What are the symptoms of uh, Kibo Bay uh, swung his bow very fast after the shot? Is, is that a, a symptom of, of pushing hard? I, I, don't, I don't think so, because the people who actually play at the podium, they have a really good balance. It's 90% archers has a good balance. If they're not but the balanced, then that the critical movement is very big and move, movement will be occupied for the, their arrows grouping. But I would say more than 90% archers, when they come to the depth podium, they are all very steady and balanced well. Why? Because they are sounds, how mechanically sounds technique. So some people may, that's what I say, some people may feel like today I'm pushing my ball. But a couple of months later, I feel like I'm doing more pulling my the draw hand side. They could, uh, archers feeling can be changed time to time. But we have to stick with the, uh, what is the principle over to make the better balance for each person to shoot better? So it, interesting point is like, if you asking your archers, okay, let's try to push your bomb today. And then next day, try to even just only pulling your bomb at the draw side today. And you can see the, what the people react, what people are saying to the coaches, which one is better, more efficient for them to shoot. But that is what I'm coming from. The make the perfect balance is the best key for the expansion and make this execution more accurate and consistent. Jacqueline, how, how do you, Kisik talked about something that's, that's um, for most of us, we're going to see the, these tiny, small details. How, how do you spot that? And how do you uh, create a method for each specific archer? Um. You, you can uh, check that when you have a tape on your chest card and when they are in full draw, you see the string going backwards or forwards. So you can see if they were pushing or they are pulling. And when you film it, you can also let, uh, see it to the athlete. So they see what they're doing and then they understand it also better. So you're creating another reference point on the body that you then film and video analyze yeah. and you can go through it. And, and whilst you may have a framework for, for teaching uh, how to shoot, do, do you change your method or do you tinker it specifically for individual athletes? And, and how do you identify how to do which, which version of the, 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 oh, the shot? That's so 
that, that's difficult. Everybody is, is, is different and uh, with youth, they are not growing completely. So maybe the, the, the length of the arms is not correctly and it's, it's individual. So you have to you have to be very specific with each yes. archer, and 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 uh, more so than that as they're going through maturity. Yes. Okay. Got to. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, are there other techniques that you use uh, to spot uh, little changes that you can make to improve some of your top archers? Just want to add that before we get in the top archers, it's really difficult to find proper way to shoot because archers are growing too fast. We always working with the top archers, but uh, when they become in that point, they always start to be in the national teams in 13 years old, 14 years old, and this, these ages are really, they are, fast, they are growing really fast in that age. And every day they are changing, and their muscle lengths are changing, their bones are getting taller. In, for example, uh, four years ago, I was cutting one dozen arrow per month for Meta. He was growing at least every month. This is really difficult to find proper way till they get 19 or 20 years old. But when the archers get 19 and 20 years old, and in that case, also if the archer have at least 10 years experience, it's easier to find some uh, focusing point when they start shooting in the shooting line, and also easier to manage their mind. But before then, this is really important. Archer needs some experience about to have some proper shoot and proper release, actually. Yeah, so you're getting the miles on the clock early doors, but you've got to work at full maturity before you can really do the fine tuning. Richard, do you have anything to add to that? Do you follow that one specific model and, and that's how all your archers shoot? Or do you have that tinkering right at the end? No, I think I have to um, find out what the archer can actually do. Uh, so that's a, a phone in the office here that's, that's going... I, I just some archers can only do it one way. Uh, I have to find out how they can actually get through the clicker. Um, some are not comfortable off the front, some are not comfortable off the bats, some like to rotate. Um, really, it, it's getting into the, the optimum position at full draw. Um, and then how can that archer get through that one millimeter uh, under pressure in a competition easily? Okay. Uh, look, you, you've you brought me to a, to a nice point now, and I want to ask uh, all of you the same. I want to get an answer from all of you for the same question. Why, well, Carlos? We'll start with you. Uh, obviously, you guys are very important uh, on the field. Any coach in any sport is very important. But surely these top archers uh, can feel the difference. They must be able to understand, especially when they've been at the top for for a long time. Uh, can they make these small adjustments themselves or does it always require an external party to give them that information? In, in my way of coaching, I try to teach the archers to learn how to take their own decision and feel. So I think when you start with an archer as a beginner, you have to give a lot of instruction. But my goal is to teach them progressively enough knowledge that when they reach the top, the coach is a consultant. It's just there when they have a question and they already have the answer. They just want to know your opinion. So answering your question, I think a top archer should know, should feel what is this little difference. And you are there as a coach, yes, to, to be a consultant, to, to agree or to give your opinion when you, the archer asks. But in this level, I, I'm sure that Brady knows very well if he's close to a clicker, if he's struggling, if he, he, he knows enough the, the challenges and how to solve them. That's, that should be work in training. And answering your question, yes, a top archer should feel it and we coach I don't think we can do much more in this in competition. In training, we can debate and try to help them to find some of the solution when they come to us. Uh, uh, well, Carlos, just sticking with you, uh, you, you say that they can feel it. Well, uh, this is a really wide question, I know, but can you define it? What, uh, for, for someone who's, who's uh, watching archery and, and wants to understand a little bit more about what the archer is going through, especially at that crucial point, what, what uh, does it feel like? Actually, it's about feeling. When, when you are shooting, you don't see yourself. So it's very difficult to understand what you are doing. And Kissy was saying before, sometimes the archer feel they're pushing and sometimes they feel they're pulling. And in fact, they're doing the same. It's the, the feeling very subjective. So what archers do when they train is to try to create a feeling by touching bottoms, making the shooting sequence, they create a general feeling of the shot. So they know what bottom they have to touch to create a good shot. When you go in a competition, you have more adrenaline, you lose a bit this feeling, 
but you know what button you have to touch, what sequence of the shot you have to keep going to, to release your, to make your shot. And you have shot so many thousands of arrows that your body knows. So the only thing we can do by thinking not properly or thinking too much or not focusing is to distract and lose this feeling. So I know it's difficult to understand what the feeling of a good shot, but I trust you, trust me, any archer will make a good shot and feel it like, wow, that's what I want to do. And this is a consequence of touching the right button in the proper sequence, always in the same way. That's training about. Yeah. Richard, your thoughts on that? The top archers. Yes, of course. It's all about feelings. I mean, you know, in competitions, it is, our shooting is, is almost a little bit more rough. We, we're not focusing on all the details, we're just focusing on one thing. Uh, and we're trying to get off a good, clean shot. Um, if we're having to move too much through the clicker, then the feelings, well, you, you know straight away when you've come up short. Uh, but I guess that's one of the things that I see most in competition when somebody is struggling is that they haven't set the shot up properly. So they put so much pressure on themselves to try and get through the expansion bit. They're having to do too much. Very interesting point. I think I might come back to that shortly, Richard. Got thoughts about uh, the top archers and, and whether they feel things. And uh, do you see it differently? You, you deal with so many top archers yourself. For me, it's a little bit different because I have some basic rules about the shooting form. I should have to follow that basic rules. But at the end, of course, they have some different feelings day by day. But also another point of my view, the feeling is, okay, it's important. Archery is completely about feeling. But, but the main thing is not the feeling, just doing. Archer doesn't have to try to feel, he just has to try to do it. On the training also, we are working on it. And because of this in the competition, I have some basic rules. Archer has to follow that basic rules, but at the end they are making some slight changes during, the, uh, during their end. But I always keep saying to my archer, if you follow my rules, at the end, if you have bad result, it is my responsibility because I am the responsible person to find proper solutions for your problems. But if you try your own way, it is your problem. You have to solve that problem with your own way. We have to, you have to decide some, something. When the archers become the Turkish national team, I always keep saying these things. I have some basic rules. If you follow me, I will be responsible. If not, Okay, you can try, you can stay. If you can stay here, you are always welcome. But if you cannot stay here, I cannot do anything more for you. And this is uh, what I'm thinking. But about the feeling, I'm agree. Archery is completely about feeling. But I really don't like when the archer says, I don't feel good today. You don't have to feel good. You have to shoot good. That's it. You have to <laughs> do. <laughs> do it. You, don't, you just don't try to feel it. Just do it. Because if your brain makes same uh, orders to your muscles, your muscles have to follow it. But if you try to, what did I order to my muscles, then you will get some, a lot of problems. This is the main problem for the archery. I mean, I can say for the Turkish archers, this is exactly the biggest problem now because when they start shooting, especially in the competition, they just try to find their best feeling, what they have just two or three days before in the training. But it is different day and Same. you wake up earlier than that. Day. You eat different things. You are in different field. You are in different weather conditions. Your body is completely different that, and that day. You have to find the survive for that day. You don't have to try to uh, feel same feelings as you have three days before or one month before it. And this so, is what I think about it. So you too, that's why you have Nike. Just do it, no? Yeah, just do it. That's it. This is a message too. <laughs> that's why I publicity. Well done. Just do it. <laughs> don't feel. Okay, don't by doing, you create a feeling. You don't have to look for the feeling. <laughs> consequence of doing yes yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not emotional sport this is just as richard said we, when we start this is a uh, moving start sport we all, are, also, always basically say this is a mortal sport mortal combat is like we are, combat. we are human we have to feel yeah. and have emotion yep Okay, so again, I'll come to you on, on this. I, I want to get everyone's point on this, but I, I absolutely hear what both uh, Richard and uh, Dr. have said about that, that uh, it doesn't matter how you feel on the day. You've just got to go through your process. But just go back to this feeling for the top archers for sure can feel. This is, the, this is what I'm hearing, guys. Yep. The, I think maybe we have to learn from each other. Is for example, the top level archers, they are all stubborn because they are more you know, stay with a comfortable zone and with the feeling, but they always have room to improve. That's what number one thing, they have to take the step. 
as well as uh, when I coach more intermediate, the like young low level archers, I can learn more teaching by them and also So, but I think maybe more likely is communication in between archer and coach. So when you teach something by coach's directions, I think the feedback is very important from archers. You know, we cannot just push archers to do what coach wants to do it, but I think the communicating in between archers and coach to accept what coaches wants to drive and what the archers struggle with the direction. So, more likely, if you just communicating as a team, I think everyone can go through the, any, you know, situation or any difficulty through the, through the coaching. And finally, your thoughts on this idea of uh, the athletes having an understanding and, and a feeling they can feel when things aren't going right, they can notice it and, and then even adapt. Yeah, our top athletes notice when it, then the, they, they feel they feel and, and, and you can see it often because when the feeling is not good, the timing is often off, uh, straightly too long that they hold their arrow. And then they also have too many time to think what they are going to do or they're going to do uh, wrong. So timing, it's, it's very important. Okay. Well, this this is an interesting topic, but I want to I want to come back a little bit from just the, the very top archers and start talking about those archers who want to get to the top. Uh, they've they've done some miles already. They've done some training. They have a good understanding of the position they need to get into. Uh, I want to talk to about what you do from a coaching perspective in two scenarios. Scenario number one in the training field when when you're trying to get them to the top what changes can you make there and then and how do you do it uh, and then how do you compare that to making those changes in competition on the shooting line for real on those days that uh, you know the, the pressure is really on Jacqueline start with start with you on that one. Oh, that's 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 not easy to to answer I think it's uh, the the athletes must uh, do what they learn on the on the trainings and not uh, going to focus on the target so they need to stay on the line with the body and the movements they make this is on the training field you're talking about yes now also in, in 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 the in the competitions competitions need to be on the body not on the target Okay, I, I understand that, but let's just, I just want to talk, uh, let's just stick with training on the training field. If you notice a mistake, if you notice a, a, a mistake that keeps happening over, over and over again, perhaps drawing too much, pulling too much, pushing too much, how do you change it on that, on that training field? Uh, most of all, uh, I think it's with the balance. So we are going back to the balance, to the feet, to the alignment of the, of the body. So back to basics, Kisik. Back, back to basics, yes. Back to basics, Kisik. What about you? Where, where, what do you do on the training field when you spot uh, someone doing the same mistake over and over again? Specifically, when we're talking about to pull this balance. I think you know most important thing is archers must understand how they can perform under pressure rather than shooting better in practice time, because practice is like you have a shelter. You know, everyone can shoot well. But still, I cannot believe it. Like, for example, when I go to the World Cup level, the first day when we have an official practice day, I just cannot believe it by myself, how people shoot so well, you know? But when you come to the competition, it's not many people can shoot 680s yet, right? The world is moving and better, but still practice and competition is a totally different environment. Mm. So we as coach, while they, we approach the top level archers, we need these things better work on for the, for the future is because coaches know what is going to happen under pressure. So this is the reason why I think communication make them understanding what we're trying to teach, what we're trying to achieve, and then archer will, you know, accept that. And, you know, time to time, you know, you have to break down and go to the brain barrel and you just, uh, you know, spend a couple of hours to the basic 
things to fix the issues. But the more likely as a human being, they have to understand, they have to agree what I need to do in order to be better. I think that is key. If you just, uh, you know, train a horse or train dog, you know, you don't need to explain, you know, you just uh, make them to do it. But archery is a human, you know, human sports, which means most important things archery need to understand what we need, why we need these things to do. Okay, so back to basics for Jacqueline, a uh, combination of uh, training work and uh, managing your human emotions, I guess, on the competition field for Kisik. Uh, Goktug, what about you? Would you add to that? The, uh, I'm talking again specifically about the differences you can make uh, in training and competition in, in terms of this, this release, this final part of the action. My idea, my idea also will be the same as Jacqueline and Kisik. Maybe it will be a combination because if I should have some new mistakes during the training on the competition, that means there's some problem in the, in the routine. And we have to find that problem in the routine. We have to return back uh, from the beginning. Then we have to clarify all steps, uh, step by step his routine. Then we can define where is the main problem and we can solve it before start the competition. And because of this, of course, we need time. We need to understand, we need some feedback exactly then also we have to have some uh, I mean I always filming the arches before going to competition then I always try to filming the arches during the competition to to evaluate after competition or during the competition also it's really important to have some data we need some have we should have some data before then we can compare and we can understand where's the, where's the problem and it it will be easy to explain to Archer and make them understand and make it uh, clear routine again. So getting back to that consistency, uh, and which is, uh, well, seems to be the running theme whenever we're talking about archery. Richard, would you add anything to what your esteemed colleagues have said on this subject of, uh, of fixing problems, spotting problems and fixing them on the training field or in competition? Um, yeah, I think the most exciting part for me as a coach, I think, is um, is watching the archers in competition. When you observe them there, you see breakdown points or errors in technique that never seem to happen in training. Um, so I try not to get wrapped up in the emotions of a competition. I'm, I'm just trying to play mad. I'm just, I'm just looking for the breakdown points, and then we can address those when we get back onto the training ground, or sometimes we can fix them on the during the competition, but often there isn't time, especially in matches. Um, but yeah, the observation part is is crucial. Uh, but yeah, for sure, archers break down in competition. That's um, why most don't win. <laughs> well, only one can win most of the time. Exactly. <laughs> um, Hey, Juan Carlos, uh, let's go back uh, to the, the very basics again, uh, as Jacqueline suggested we should do. Um, if, we're, if we're getting to the point where we want to, to break into the world's top uh, archery uh, teams, uh, what, would the, what would be the very specific things that you would say need to be trained on? And are there any specific exercises, for example, to practice balance that these archers uh, can do to improve? Okay, you change the subject fast. I was answering, the, I was ready for the previous one, but okay, I will go on that one. I would say one of the, the first thing is uh, it's the work, it's train hard. And I see many, many artists who has a big goal, has a, a lot of ambitions, but they are not willing to put the time and the effort that is needed to reach this place. So unfortunately, it's about work, 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 and more work. And of course, if you are going to work and put so much effort, you have to get the right exercise and the right technique. So get a good coach and, and start working with a method and with a plan and a program. But uh, trying to reach a high level without putting your time, work and effort and focus uh, body and mind to your goals is, is impossible. It's, uh, I used to say, if it's easy, it's not archery, it's football. So <laughs> archery, you have to put the time and you have to put the effort. The, the easy part is we are not an opponent. We are our opponent. You, you have your limits, which yeah. sometimes is good, but sometimes it's, it's, uh, you have to deal with your own issues to reach higher levels. So for me, this is the key part. And make sure that the uh, archer, when they come to you and wants to reach a high goal, they understand that the high level of commitment and work that is needed, and it's not going to happen tomorrow. It might happen in five, six, seven, or eight years. 
And this, this intention that as more I want to do it, as faster as it comes is not true. It's as more work and quality work you put, as, as more it comes, but in a long time. It's, it's nothing short. And I would like to go back to the difference training and competition, because one thing that we struggle a lot is we let the archers train too calm and too comfort zone and too relaxed, and then in competition they try too hard. And of course, competition training will be never the same. We have a lot of adrenaline competition that we don't have in training. So we are going to feel difference. Archers feel difference, and they need to accept this. But we as coaches can try to make challenge and take them out of the comfort zone in training. So I used to say, when the archer know how to make a good shot, you need to find a way how to make it consistent. But in making it consistent, we have to make difficulty. We have to make it make them lose this feeling, make push up and then try to get the feeling back and make them run to the target, come back, increase the heartbeat and then try to make them feel back. As strong, as fast as they recover the feeling when they lose it, as more we get them ready for competition. And then as Kisik say, it's about feeling of focusing in competition, what matters. And there are so many things happening in competition that very easy that they actually focus on the wrong thing, how it's shaking, how it's breathing, thinking on future. And teaching them how to deal in competition is much more important to perform than not making them shoot more arrows in a comfort, calm, and weight zone in, in, the, in the practice field. So I like very much to put challenges in training, make surprises, make suddenly new things that take them out of the comfort zone, which help them to prepare in competition. And the observing of, of Richard, observe the archers in competition, I used to film them and then show them the body language. It's amazing how many things they do that they don't realize. So if we want to get them better in competition, we have to, to help them to create the right habits and the right focus in training. By reaching in training, knowing how to think, how to self-talk and how to focus, which gives them some more confidence to do it, to stick to something when they feel a bit lost in, in the competition. That's uh, fascinating stuff. And you, you brought, I've written down a number of things that you guys have all talked about and you've kind of brought them all into one answer. But can, can I just ask you something very specific before I move on and ask the, yes. the, the, the rest of your colleagues the same thing? This idea, I love this idea of uh, making things a little bit more pressured in training to, to replicate what might happen in competition. What can an archer do by themselves in training, uh, you know, without their coach around them all the time, which I'm sure is, you know, not, you know they're not going to be a coach there all nice. the time. It's difficult that a coach can surprise himself. <laughs> if an archer is shooting, I suddenly stop him and say, if you make a 10, I give you 100 euros, that's a surprise. It's difficult, he can do it himself. <laughs> but uh, I would say the archer, if he wants to practice by himself, or he or she, and wants to make his life a bit more complicated, get it for competition, is create challenges. As soon as he feels that it's in a comfort zone, and training is about knowing how to make the shot and knowing how good you can be. But as soon as you know how good you can be, you have to challenge this. So many, very often there's windy days and archers go indoor. No, 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 stay outside and challenge yourself with wind. Or it's a rainy day and they go, no, no, no get wet. <laughs> I, I, I was famous in Spain to be a masochist. I was shooting with rain, rain, uh, with the snow. I wanted to get ready for everything and challenge my form. You lose a form, okay, you go back indoor, you build it. When you have built it, you go back out and challenge it. And by challenge your form and your your goals as much as possible, you become stronger. So that's what I would like to say. If an archer is alone and has no coach to challenge and give surprises, try to find challenge and try to see in any moment, you cannot be shooting like a robot. You have to find out how much you can improve and how much difficult you can do it and, and beat this time. For those of you watching this workshop who don't necessarily know who Juan Carlos is, first off, where have you been? Uh, He's not talking about being a masochist. He's talking about the sacrifices he made in order to get an Olympic gold medal in 1992. So that's, uh, go back and have a look at that. I'm sure you can all find that uh, in the footage. Uh, Jacqueline, do you, do you agree with Juan Carlos putting challenges in play uh, in, in training, especially for this thing that we're talking about today, this push-pull balance, this release, the click, all these things that we talked about. Is that what you do and how do you do it? Yes, that's, that's also what we're doing. And we have a lot of rain and we have a lot of wind, so that's not so difficult to, to train <laughs> in the Netherlands. But also, uh, he said something about self-talk, uh, positive self-talk. Yeah? Talk to yourself. You are good. You are uh, doing, doing well. And that you need to do also in uh, a competition when it's, when it's not feeling good. Then you must not uh, do a self-talk to you when you to downsize you but to pick you up so and and that you also can do in uh in the practice 
let them say things loudly. Oh, what do you feel? What do you think? So then, then they uh, beware of what they are doing. Interesting. Kisik, you have anything to add? Your challenges, what challenges do you put in front of your archers in training to mimic competition? I think that's more coming from the archers' honesty. How actually, you, they, everyone says, I want to win Olympic gold medal. Everyone wants to say, I want to go to Olympic. Everyone wants to say, I want to go to world championship. Is that really your goal? Then you have to honest, honest, honest what <clears throat> you need to require in training. So it's uh, like, you know, we're not trained, again, we're not trained anymore. You know, we train human. The human, that means they must uh, find a fine goal, clear goal, and being honest by themselves, then training is going to be uh, more smoother and also, you know, field will be hard because if they have a clear goal and what they want to be, and then they will, they will training more, you know, the properly. Got Doesn't matter to, what level they are. Good points. Doctor, what about you? Do you throw in a few surprises in training? Yes, exactly. And also we are doing a lot of challenging in training. Also, we are doing some run, shoot and core combinations. I mean, I choose as this year, it has to run three minutes, but it's not it's like a joke. They have some specific heart rate has to reach in three minutes. And after, as soon as they reach that heart rate, they have to shoot six arrows. We, in 90 seconds, sometimes we just try to increase heart rates and try to decrease the shooting time, try to make really big pressure on the archers during the training. And in the same time, also, we are checking the scores. We are doing some scoring rounds like that. And also, sometimes we are playing card games, but every card has some specific match scores. I mean, Brad Ellison shot final in Berlin World Cup final. Then someone choose that card, and he has to beat that scores in five events. He, we just make them compete with that archers. And we are doing that kind of challenging. Also, we have another challenge about the sun and heat. A little bit different than the Netherlands, but we have 45 degrees normally in summertime. It is also exactly a big challenge for the archers. And do you see, Gokhtu, do you see the changes in, in this point that we're talking about in this workshop when the athletes are under pressure in training? Yeah, of course it is. Uh, because in the competition, main problem is archers start to hear their heart beatings. Normally they are in comfortable zone and they are shooting like average 110, 100, less than 100 or most of them. But if we have some young archers, their heart rate average is 110 during the training. But in the competition, it rises up 120, 130s. If the archer have some weak uh, personality, it, get, it goes around 140s or something. And when the archer gets some full draw, when they try, when they start to hear the heartbeats in their ears, it makes really big pressure on, on them. And they, in that time, they always try to shoot really fast because they are starting afraid. They have something different in their mind, in their body, and they try to finish this shot as soon as possible. And also, this makes sometimes uh, bring back the ball and draw in again, bring back the ball, draw in again. And I try to make it useful for these archers, for our archers. They always try, get used to hear their heartbeats in their ears and get, they always uh, try to use to shaking during the shot because when you have 170, 175 heart rates, it's not easy to get full draw expansion and aiming in the same time. And also when you combine it with some core training, when you have uh, some pain on their core muscles, it gets really difficult to shoot. And we are doing this kind of challenging uh, in the training too. Richard, finally you, what happens in the GB camp in training? How do you as your athletes? Um, many different ways. It depends on which phase we, we are with our training. So, we, you know, the, a lot of our training here is trying to get the archers to be bow fit. Uh, that, that, that's a different kind of scenario. But as we're tapering down towards competitions, yeah, we will introduce uh, lots of simulations. We will... Um, try to make the training more like a competition so, and then we'll try and flip it around so competition is more like the training they don't quite meet in the middle but we have to um to get the artists to think in a slightly different way um i always worry when 
archers who just go through the motions of just shooting arrows in training and they, they go on automatic and they're not actually, they might get okay scores, but they're not actually improving. I need them to put a lot more thought into what they're doing. Um, they have to put some pressure on themselves and their own pride in their performance to, um, to get better. I know when we have um, some great joint training camps in Turkey um, and the and Gokdo always kills our archers because he reduces the time limits all the time. Uh, his archers are really good at that. Ours do struggle till they get up to speed. Uh, it's probably the one of the biggest things we can do to actually put some pressure on the archers is to, you know, cut a minute off the time at least, or two and a half minutes off the time. Then, of course, they're out of the comfort zone uh, mm. and on the field under pressure. Interesting stuff. Right. Well, I've got two. Very quick fire questions. I, I want a very quick answer from each of you on these last two questions. Uh, the first one is about biggest enemy to this critical part of the shot, the getting to that full draw and the release and, and follow through. Uh, Juan Carlos, let's start with you. Big, biggest enemy, short answer. For, for me, trying too hard. When you try too hard, you try a perfect shot, normally you go out of the normal sequence. You don't need a perfect shot to make a 10. You make a good shot. And many good shots make many 10. And very often we try too hard. Archers try too hard. Now is the day I have to do it. Now I have to make a 10 and they try too hard. And it's not happening. So I used to say, make it hard in training. Let it happen in competition. Competition another day in the office with a bit more adrenaline. Kisik. <clears throat> this for me, what I see the most... Uh, the important things for our training field is uh, timing. So timing means how much is not the whole sequence from the setup to the all the way to the you shooting. The timing in archery talking about only the how much time consumed for click, which is aiming time. So I would say <coughs> archers as you. They try too hard. They try to too much aim, which is cause the timing longer. Then you lose everything. Not only the your strength or, or endurance, but also your mental focus as well. So this is the reason why less aiming is the key for training for the high level archers. Excellent, Jacqueline. What would you? Ha what's your answer to that question? The timing and keep it simple. Keep it, keep it simple. The the movements you make, keep it simple and timing. Goktuk. For me also aiming. When the archer try to get really good aim, he kick the stop his left arm, stop pushing, and everything goes wrong after that. He, they lost their balance. And aiming archer doesn't need to aim, he just need to follow. Okay. Aiming is not a main process in our shooting form. Aiming is just that just pin has to be on the middle. That's it. We and Richard, what would you add to that? Yeah, I see two big enemies really. Of course, over aiming that that's the, the biggest one. And then the other one that I see so much is when an archer starts to try. So by trying, they, they add conscious brain muscular tension into the shot. And of course, straight away, it blocks that nice expansion extending to get through the clicker. Okay, so my last question to all of you, and Richard, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, there's no bows, there's no arrows, there's an archer right in front of you. Coach, what's the best thing I can do? What's the best exercise I can do without a bow and an arrow to improve this particular part of my shooting? My favorite piece of kit is just to use a simple piece of rope or a string, which has a, a fixed length to it, which you'll carefully fit to just slightly short of their normal draw length. And then the archer will get inside of that at full draw. And then they start to feel the power of the shot across the shoulders. They get the balance, they feel the line. And you, you're adding, you're trying to move the, as if you're trying to move the arrow through the clicker. Uh, it doesn't move, of course, but you have great feelings within the body. You really start to feel the balance. Gok Tug. Archer can lay down to uh, round and they can put his pushing arm to uh, floor, then try to make proper alignment because he, as soon as they get 
appropriate alignment, they will not be able to stand. And when they align their shoulder, they will be they will understand what is the real predro position, what is the real shoulder alignment. So where are you putting your front hand there? The pushing arm has to be on the floor. Floor. Yeah, like a, a push-up position, but not exactly push-up position. Just mm -hmm. turn like this. You're pushing arm on the floor. Then just bring your drawing arm to chin. Then try to find proper alignment about your shoulder. Kasich. So <clears throat> I think it's a couple of uh, uh, device people can carry without equipment. That is stretch band, as Richard says. But also, I highly recommend have a, like kind of a strap. You know, this is not extending, but when you adjust your your full draw holding positions with that kind of a strap, you can build up the good alignment as well as good feeling, maintaining good feeling. And not only that, you can do more isometric training as well. So, you know, just maintaining feeling and your mental game, even you don't have any ball. I think that's very important. And Jacqueline, what are your thoughts on what you would recommend? The, the, the side plank that uh, Gokduk said, your, your hands on the floor and then your alignment take with your elbow and also you have uh, the stabilization on your body. And that's a very good one. And you, you, you have to uh, have your uh, shoulders in the, in the right position so you make use of your bone structure and not your muscles. Uh. Plus, you had the first word. I'm going to give you the last one. What would you add to your esteemed colleagues and okay. the advice you would give? I use all of those that they say, which are very good because you, you have something to hold. But I will add one that is a kind of combination of mimic and imaginary. So standing in position, closing your eyes, imagine you have all the bow and you make the sequence of taking the arrow, putting the knock, imagine all this, make the sequence moving, find the full draw, find one muscle, make you expand, get the feeling without bow visualizing and making imaginary without any effort, in fact, is training the, the neurons, the training the sequence, the same as with the bow, without the interference of the physical part. So if we combine the one of my colleagues, which are physical, with the one of the, the brain, the one of following the sequence, and you can do it with movement or without movement. With movement is easier, you feel it. Without movement, you are just activating the, the mind. It's, it's very efficient. Unfortunately, not many artists take the time to make 10 minutes of this kind of mental training. But in fact, we all talk about mental training, but then archers don't do it too much. So the self-talk of this is very good. They can do it when training, but imaginary and, and mimics to find the right position. And if you want to add a camera and film yourself from the same position with bow, without bow, you will feel that position has changed. So you are able to reach the position, the same one without the bow, that the one we have with the bow, that's a very good training without in fact shooting. Brilliant stuff. Um, Thank you to all of you. A fascinating topic, which uh, I feel that we've only just uh, tickled the tip of the iceberg on. There's plenty more to discuss, but really appreciate all your time and your wise words. And thanks to all of you for watching.